Hey everybody, welcome back to another video. Today I'm working on the original PlayStation. This is the first of several PS1s that I have sitting in the repair backlog. This particular unit's a little bit dirty, but otherwise in very good cosmetic shape. This is the North American launch model that was released in 1995. The model number is SCPH-1001, and these are the units that had the direct RCA jacks on the back. Although these models are somewhat desirable, they're notorious for having optical drive issues that were resolved in later models, and the one I have right here is no exception. I always test consoles with the cleanest discs that I own to get a good baseline for how well the optical drive is working, so let's start this game up and watch and listen to what this console is doing. After the PlayStation logo, the console appears to start reading the disc right away, so at first glance everything looks like it's working. But as soon as the full motion video starts, it's clear that this console's got some optical drive issues. The video is very choppy, the sound's distorted, and sometimes it doesn't even play the full intro, it just locks up and you have to power cycle the system. Other times you can skip the intro, start a game, and maybe get 15 minutes or so of play before it needs to start loading data from disk again, and then it locks back up. I'm gonna try and refurbish this drive as a bit of a learning exercise to better understand why this problem happens in the first place and to see if there's anything that can be done about it. First order of business is cleaning and re-lubricating the optical drive. The system's 25 years old, there's going to be caked up grease on both the gears and rails. Re-lubricating the moving parts and giving the lens a wipe down can often go a long way to resolving discrete issues on an otherwise working drive. The grease used on the drive is not supposed to be black. What we're actually looking at here is fine plastic shavings from the tray or sled caused by friction of the plastic parts rubbing against each other. This was a design flaw that affected all the launch models, which Sony addressed in later revisions by making the tray out of die-cast metal. These shavings are obviously not making it any easier for the sled to ride back and forth, so we're gonna give the drive a thorough cleaning to clear out all that debris and see if it performs any differently. All of that black residue coming off is more of those fine plastic shavings. Now that the parts are thoroughly cleaned, we can actually get our first good look at the damage that causes all these drives to fail. On both the upper and lower parts of the assembly, you can see where material is missing from the friction caused by these plastic parts moving against each other. Let's see if a generous amount of lithium grease will compensate for some of that wear and make any difference in how well the drive performs. So it's not unexpected, but re-lubricating the drive made absolutely no difference to the skipping issues. So the logical next step is to check the laser's intensity using the measuring test point above the drive's potentiometer. 
According to the service manual, this should read 11.4 millivolts when the laser is in the upward position. In other words, when the PlayStation is reading a disc. It can be tricky to adjust the potentiometer with the disc inserted, so instead, I chose to press the security switch with my flush cutters and take the measurement as soon as I turn on the system. My unit's registering 12.1 millivolts, which is actually a little bit higher than it should be. Let me turn the system off and back on again and take that reading one more time. And still getting 12.1 millivolts. Now, usually when your old and tired laser is beginning to have discrete issues, you want to give it a little bit more power, not less power. But for the sake of this exercise, I'm going to tune it to spec, so I'm going to dial it down a little bit until I get 11.4. I also don't know the history of this console, so it's possible someone's messed with it before. It could have come like that from the factory, I don't know. The screw adjustment is very sensitive to even the slightest rotation, so after going too high a few times and too low a few times, I eventually got to a reading that was close to the one I was targeting. On these older PlayStations, there's two additional settings responsible for laser alignment that we need to be concerned with. The first of these is a potentiometer for the bias, and the second is a potentiometer for the gain. And the measuring test point for both of these is labeled CL708. I'm removing the flush cutters that I was using to press the security switch, because to set the bias it doesn't need to be pressed. And once the console starts up, the bias should read 1.7 volts at idle. Mine's a little bit high at 1.735, so I'm just going to dial it down a little bit until I get 1.7. Alright, perfect, 1.7. Last but not least, we need to check the gain by inserting a disc and pressing the security switch, and that same measuring test point should show a value between 1.8 and 1.85 volts. Mine's a little bit high, so I'm going to adjust it down until I get around 1.82 volts. Okay, perfect. Now my optical drive's fully adjusted to spec. Okay, let's try that game again and see if the laser alignments made any difference to the skipping issues that we're experiencing. Unfortunately guys, there was no difference whatsoever. I have one more trick up my sleeve. I'm gonna try and build up some of that missing material that's been shaved away using a thin piece of aluminum in an attempt to get the laser level again so it falls back into alignment. I've cleaned all the grease from the underside of the sled where I'm gonna be inserting that thin piece of metal. This aluminum drive cover is from a broken DVD player. It's about 0.2 millimeters thick and it should be perfect for this exercise. This is why it's always a good idea to have a couple of electronics in your junk pile. They always come in handy in unexpected ways. As luck would have it, the battery on my caliper ran out, but I just used the ruler to manually mark a width of 2 millimeters. Then, using a ruler, I just scored a line between the two points I marked. And I followed that up with the box cutter to get a nice clean cut down that channel. Although this material is thin enough to cut with a pair of scissors, I want the strip to be as flat as possible, so using a box cutter guaranteed that I could get that result. The strip fit perfectly on the underside of the sled where I need to prop up the material. I noticed there was a small bevel that was preventing the strip from sitting flat. I didn't feel like cutting a narrower aluminum strip, so instead I just decided to shave off that bevel with a small file. And after that was done, I had a flat surface. Now I'm just marking where I need to cut it off the other side. And I'm gently filing one side to make it a little bit rougher so that when I glue it down, the glue has something to hold on to. One final dry fit to make sure no other adjustments are needed. 
wipe both surfaces down with some IPA, and finally super glue it in place. All right, looking good. So now you can actually see what the shim is doing. It's introducing about 0.2 millimeters of height to the underside of the sled where the material's worn down the most. And the drive goes back together the same way that it did before. All right, let's press the security switch, make sure this thing still moves. That's sliding normally, so far so good. Nothing left to do, but test the game. Absolutely incredible, guys. This was a tricky project, especially on the research side of things. I'll share a few closing thoughts. First off, I can't take credit for this repair. I got this idea from a 20-year-old website that someone put up on the net, and I'm going to link that website in the description below. But I hadn't seen a YouTube video of someone bringing one of these drives back to life using an aluminum shim. And these sorts of repairs that predate YouTube get lost to time as the websites that they're hosted on get abandoned. Now, does this mean this is a permanent fix? Probably not. The drive has design flaws, it's completely made of plastic, so at best we're probably just getting a little bit more mileage out of it. I still think you should always clean and re-lubricate an optical drive as a first order of business. Then you could look into calibrating the laser. A previous owner may have attempted a laser adjustment so it could be out of sync. And at least on this system, the values are pretty well documented on online forums from people that have access to the repair manual. Having said all that, this was primarily a learning exercise to educate myself on the history of this console and its design flaws. I have two identical units in my repair pile with the exact same issue, and I just went ahead and ordered aftermarket optical drives for those units from China. While I'm glad that I was able to repair this unit and keep it original, I'm just not going to be bothered to do this for every launch model PS1 that I come across. Alright guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Take care and I'll see you same time next week.